Okay, thank you. Um, the paper is co-authored with um, Niels Christian Borman at ETH Zurich. Um, he did a lot of work on the paper. So, again, first slide, elections are important. One of the reasons why they're important is they help in democracies, they're part of the defining feature, but they also help the process of accountability and responsiveness that we think is central to aspects of democracy. And the extent to which electoral rules can do this or electoral systems play this role depends on the very specific nature of the rules that are used to aggregate votes, et cetera. So the paper is really an extension, it's, it's, a, it's a research note that describes an extension of the data set that some of you may have used on electoral systems in, in, in democracies. And it extends the data set from 1946 or independence to 2011. It makes the data set that I had before about a third, it's about 33, 34% larger than the original data set. Um, so we've got slightly over 1,000 legislative elections and 433 presidential elections. One other thing that we try to do with the data set was we, we've tried to put a little bit more detail in. So now we've got dates of each rounds of elections. We've got formulas in each of the different tiers, not just in the electoral tier. So there's a little bit more detail going back to the previous elections as well as the new elections that we've, we've added. Um, just to give you a, a sense of what's in the data, um, Again, we only look at democracies. These are the rules, the Chebu, Gandhi, Vreeland, originally the Shavorsky rules. Um, <clears throat> all four of these questions need to be met with a yes um, for it to be a democracy. If any one of them is missing, we have a dictatorship and they're not in our data set. So what's the general uh, feel for the data? <clears throat> Here are the number of legislative and presidential elections by decade, we can see a large increase in the 1990s, obviously transitions to democracy um, in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Um, but one of the things that we, we, we see is the relative increase in the number of presidential elections. So whereas legislative elections sort of outnumbered four to one, three to, three to one in the 50s, 60s, 70s, is now getting sort of two to one. And one of the main reasons is there's a slight increase in the number of presidential democracies around the world, but most of this increase is due to the, the increasing number of semi-presidential democracies where presidents are elected. Obviously, the 2000s, the decade that we're really adding, was the, the decade with the most democratic elections, and several countries held democratic elections for the first time um, in these particular years. One of the things that we've done is we've changed the classification of electoral systems. I think it makes a whole lot more sense. Um, my original paper that was done a, a, a long time ago now had served different purposes. Um, but the classification scheme is purely on an electoral formula now. So you have majoritarian systems. These are systems where the candidate or the parties with the most votes wins. Proportional systems, these are divisor or quota-based systems in multi-member districts, or mixed electoral systems where certain candidates are elected through majoritarian method, methods and other candidates are elected through proportional methods. And each of the, these different electoral systems subcategories are all listed for each electoral tier in, in, in a country. So there's a lot of, a lot of detail um, put into this, and I'll be happy to describe some of these if anyone's interested. What's the distribution between these electoral formula families, electoral system families over time? Um, what we've seen is the proportion of elections, the legislative elections that use proportional formulas has remained fairly constant. It's around 50%. But we've seen over time a reduction in the proportion of majoritarian systems and a, and a rise in the proportion of um, mixed electoral systems. The number of mixed electoral systems is, is essentially more than doubled, and the majoritarian systems has shrunk by a, a, a about a third. This is the geographic distribution um, in 2011, at the end of 2011. Um, you can see colonial patterns. So British and French colonies have stuck with kind of majoritarian electoral systems. Europe and Latin America have traditionally had proportional representation systems dominating. But in both of those regions, more so in Europe than in Latin America, but in both cases, we're, we're seeing the introduction of more mixed electoral systems combining majoritarian and proportional systems. Um, and in the paper, we show this by decade, so you can see the emergence of new countries and how the electoral systems have shifted geographically. 
What about the different types of subcategories of electoral systems? Well, clearly, um, of the majoritarian systems, virtually all the countries are using some kind of single member district plurality system. Uh, the most common type of electoral system is some kind of list proportional representation system. So more countries use proportional systems than single member district, but if you did it by population, more people actually live under a single member district plurality system than under a proportional system, just because many of the large countries like India are using single member district plurality. Somewhat interestingly, of the list proportional representation systems, um, the largest or the most common system is, is a divisor system, De Hunt, which is not the most proportional of the proportional systems. Okay, there's probably one of the least proportional formulas. Um, and of the quota systems, hair quota dominates by, by a lot. What's interesting, though, is when we go to the mixed electoral systems, um, we get a reversal in the use of the proportional formula. Virtually all of the mixed electoral systems in their proportional co component use a hair system and, and relatively few use the de Hunt system. And, and so that sort of indicates to me that there is really an attempt to, to create proportionality to a high degree in, in, in the mixed systems. We're also seeing over time a large increase in what we call the dependent mixed systems, where the proportional element of the mixed systems are specifically designed to overcome the disproportionality produced by the, the majoritarian elements. So the two systems are not being used independently, they're used conditionally on each other. And those types of systems have increased a lot, again, indicating a preference to try and produce more proportional outcomes. As in the original data set, we've collected information on the party system sizes, um, and, and we use this plot just to sort of give you a sense that of what's in the data, and sort of as, as somewhat of a face validity check. What we can see is, particularly if we look at the established democracies, we see a certain amount of evidence for Duvigerian theories of party system size, which is good since I've supported that in the past. Um, but one of the things we see is that proportional systems are generally larger on average than majoritarian systems. The number of parties in the legislature, parliamentary parties, is consistently less than three in the, in, in the, majoritar in, in the majoritarian systems. And we also see strong evidence for the mechanical effect of electoral systems. The gap between the parties that win votes and the parties that win seats is much smaller in proportional systems and larger in the majoritarian systems as we transfer from votes in, in, into seats. And as Duvigier predicted, we see much less of a consistent pattern in the non-established democracies where voters have yet to create solid links between parties change their names, have they got affiliations with these parties, et cetera. It's much harder to get Duvigierian dynamics in non-established democracies. Presidential elections. We have five categories of presidential elections, plurality, absolute majority, qualified majority, electoral college, and the alternative vote. And we can see this across time. And this is sort of the, the, the strongest pattern in, in the data across time, is the very large increase in the proportion of presidential elections that use absolute majority rule. Um, only about 6% of the presidential elections in the 1950s used that system, but we're up to 65% in the 2000s. It's a clear preference for majoritarian systems. And again, it's typically based around the idea that you want to have the president elected by a majority. And the absolute majority system forces that by having a second round between the two candidates if no candidate wins in the first round. The US is remaining as the outlier that sticks with the Electoral College. Everyone else that used the Electoral College and there weren't very many got rid of it in the, in the 1980s. And then finally, we have numbers on the pr number of presidential candidates as, as well. Um, and again, Duvigerian dynamics kicks in here, where the number of presidential candidates in the absolute majority, the two round systems, are larger than you get in the plurality systems. We've got the 1990s and the 2000s. But there was also a lot more variation, as, again, Duvigier would predict. Um, so we've got some some face validity with, with, with the actual numbers. They fit with our theories, which is nice. Um, did want to, hopefully this is going to work. You can find the data on the web page, and there's a, OK, that's not going to work. There's a very detailed code book. So the code book goes through with each of the variables, but there's also a glossary of terms. So if you're not as familiar 
I'm speaking to the converted crowd, but most of you are familiar with how electoral systems work. But each of the terms are defined, and there are examples of how particular electoral systems take votes and turn them into seats. So if you're not familiar with this, um, you can go through and, and, and check, um, I'm sorry, improve your understanding how these electoral systems work. I did want to finish with a couple of things that I, 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 we want to do, um, which is we put this data in sort of an Excel spreadsheet. You can get it in, in an R database. You can get it in a Stata database. But they're, they're, they're rows with variables. These electoral systems are incredibly complicated. Not all the information about the electoral systems go naturally into these columns and cells in, in the data set. So what we want to do is to, to have a, a, a centralized document that provides more of the individual details. It's just very hard to, to, to categorize and, and, like I said, put it into cells. What we want to do is also have, probably for elections moving forward, the electoral laws available. So the, the specific electoral laws, examples of ballots, that you can actually see the ballots that people are using in these different countries. And then finally, for an appeal, it takes a long time to collect this data. It's easier to collect the more recent data than, than the past data. And the data is available. Everyone should use it. But organizations would like to aggregate this individually collected data. And I see this in lots of areas, not just in this area. They want to take your data set and put it with another variable and stick it into their data set. And IDEA, for example, has asked to, if they can take my data and stick it onto their web page because they were originally going to collect the historical data because they wanted more accurate sources. They found out that those more accurate sources don't actually exist, so my data is as accurate as it gets for them to stick it on their data. But this is going to discourage individuals from collecting new data if this is being collected and then aggregated and you lose credit for the, 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 the time that you put in. So I, I really feel in these data collection processes a really strong trade-off between wanting to collect the data and then discouraging people from actually going ahead and collecting the data by having these aggregated into very large databases. And I see this in the government formation literature that we've been working on, but, it, but in many other areas. So I, I don't know what people think about these data collection exercises, so I'll throw that out there as, as a concern that I have. <laughs>